I'm much better than people could, you know, understand. I'm much better climber than they realise. I walked up there recently and I walked right around the bottom of it and I, I had a sort of a, I had a self-congratulatory moment. Then I looked at the cliff and thought, the cliff's absolutely gorgeous. And at the end of it, there was what it's all about, which is me just st st stood there looking at the cliff, enjoying being there. <laughs> In October 1986, Johnny Dawes made what was viewed at the time as the most audacious lead ever achieved on British rock. 20 years on, Clogwindur Arthi's Indian face has only seen two subsequent ascents, neither of them in any better style than the original. Johnny's lead is now considered the most impressive ever accomplished in this country. It was given and still holds an unprecedented grade of E9 6C. It is still the hardest traditional climb in Britain. Described in the present guidebook as one of the best lines in the world and one of the finest and most dangerous goals for any climber. I remember it intensely, yeah. I remember the movement and how it felt um, to, to, to swing out the holes and how they feel under my hand. They're still under my hand. Indian face is an example of, you know, what bold climbs are all about. The fact that it, it's only had two repeats speaks for itself. It demands something that most people don't have. Strength with agility and flexibility, uh, which Johnny's got it in abundance. But the main thing always with climbing is what goes on in a person's head. The ability to remain cool in situations where other people wouldn't be cool is what makes the difference. It's almost 20 years now since Indian, Indian Firth received its first ascent. It was eight years after the first ascent in uh, 1994 when myself and Neil did the second and third ascents respectively and it's been almost 12 years now since then and that is curious. I think trends change in climbing, fashions change and it is a hideously dangerous route and one in one which you have to dedicate yourself to in a different sort of way really. You have to be not prepared to die to climb it but prepared to risk dying to climb it which is something that maybe people aren't so into now. Oh, it was a stupendous thing. It was, it was so far off the scale of, of, of what I really should have been climbing at the time. But I'd got in, in the habit of, of working right at the edge of what I was capable of. And Indian Face was right on the edge of, of what I was capable of. And uh, I just had a huge amount of um, affection for that that piece of wall and so I ended up on that wall kind of um, you know taking my own bet up really. That independence of spirit was present from a very early age. I was left to my own devices by two parents that had their their own uh, um, kind of way of doing things and so lived in a, a house where I could spend a lot of time outside in nature and I got to know my intuition. He soon found the perfect medium in which to express himself. I like being outside. I like something which is asymmetrical that doesn't have um, somebody telling me what and, what and what not to do. I like the fact that it's on something permanent so you, you, you can revisit it till you get it right. I just really like rock as well, and uh, I like the fact, <laughs> oh, this is really sad, but I really like the fact that it has a certain standard of difficulty, and that's associated 
with what you've done so you can think, okay, I'm getting better. And I like that feeling of knowing that I'm getting better at something. A sense of becoming was something that I really liked the idea of when I was younger because I, I didn't really get on very well with myself. I didn't really feel particularly um, you know, good about myself and climbing was something where I could feel um, competent and involved and uh, able to be with people. I was autistic, I was like a sort of autistic wild boy, you know. There's no way you'll climb as well if you're not, basically. At the time Johnny was starting to climb, the sport was undergoing a revolution. Sophisticated protection and sticky rubber boot soles were sending standards stratospheric. I don't think you can take Indian fairs out of context with the time in which it was climbed, actually. I think, I think it came at a really sort of important time in climbing, really, but almost a golden age in British climbing. Um, up until 1984, really, the bold climbs had been fairly easy climbing. And Johnny and myself and a few other people started to do harder routes in the Peak District on the Gritstone that were also very bold and quite hard. They actually started to enter sort of 7P, 7B plus, 7C climbing territory, but without much protection. Um, so it sort of heralded a new era in the mid-80s. So Indian Face kind of mind, made a culmination in the climbing that had gone on in the mid-80s and was probably the high point of that. Janus on Kerber Edge in Derbyshire is one of the benchmark outcrop routes of the revolution. Okay, Sean, say. Found that hard today. Bloody hard, yeah. Because it's hard from the other route. Yeah. What it's is good the, though. What is the grade of it? I don't know. But I gave it E77 when I did first of it. But that's because it had to. Is that the second time you've done it? Yeah. In the 1980s, Johnny wasn't operating in a vacuum. There were plenty of other adventurous spirits around. Yeah. Here is free climbing on Strone Allerdale in the Hebrides with Paul Pritchard, Bob Drury and Crispin Waddy on routes that previous generations would have thought impossible. Shit! Damn it! In the 80s we were on the sort of cusp of something new which was more, um, more physical from what was rock climbing to something which was more uh, a, a gymnastic activity. But even among the other talented and bold climbers of his day, something marked Johnny out as one of the greats. He was the craftsman who best understood the material with which he worked, the dancer whose sense of rhythm was innate. Where others guessed, Johnny knew. The way you pull on the hold is what's relevant, yeah. not, not whether you're strong or not. That's right, the way. Hey, you, you, you can't, there's not a section of crystals you put your hand on no. and you pull on them like, yeah. they're not pockets that you get in a certain you way. You put your there. fingers in, yeah. You put your hands in them and it's such a, the scale of it is such that you, you, your fingers have got to, do, got to do the listening. That's right. The individual Absolutely. finger, not, not the hand or, or, the, or the body. Yeah. The fingertips. And you don't, you don't get that by thinking, you get it by being instinctive. Yeah. Like dancing. Yeah. Except when you, when, you, when you dance, you enjoy the music, but here, you enjoy not water and wind. So it's like... Do you think you, you'll, uh, you'll move on to alpine climbing? <laughs> and mountaineering? Uh, I don't know, I've got to seem to be climbing bigger and bigger crags. Yeah. Mm. Not to 8,000 millimetres now. Yeah, 8,000 millimetres. 8,000 yeah. millimetre peaks. Yeah. yeah. I was climbing a lot better than everybody else in North Wales at the time. And that's, that, that's, that's for sure. And I think a lot of people were very jealous about that, really. And even though I was short and fat and didn't really train very much, 
I was still able to climb things that they couldn't climb. He was pushing the limits, breaking new ground. Hardback Thesaurus in Wenzorn was the first E7 on site. You can't leap that far ahead without an occasional stumble. Take us! Always within a, a groups of any period, you find one person starts to stand out. And that person in the case I'm thinking of was Johnny Dawes when he went and did Indian Face, which must be the most adventurous and daring climb in Britain, I would think. To have the bottle to do something like that is almost unbelievable. Throughout the history of British climbing, the most romantic, the most beautiful and dramatic, the major stage on which its chief dramas were played out was an architectonic, brooding cliff on the north side of Snowdon, Clogwyndir Arthi, the Black Cliff of the Black Height. The 1980s revolution was no exception, and its focus was a direct line up the lower central wall of the East Buttress, the Master's Wall. Unprotectable, minimal in its features, this is where the new generation wished to make its mark. It had had attempts from an awful lot of the top climbers of the day. One of those, John Redhead, had already proved himself doing one of the hardest routes at the time in the country, Margins of the Mind, which may have even been the eight, which he climbed in 1983 or 1984. But he was trying with less preparation than we did and was taking big falls on there. You know, has to be admired, really. Even before the advent of sticky boots, John Redhead had climbed to the halfway point on Master's Wall. It was the highest point reached to that date, and the risk was immense. The cart wheeled down the wall, 85 feet, and, and it was a big fall. It was the big fall on Cloggy, and, and I survived. But in those days, for me, there was a lot of doubt. There was a lot of doubt in the climbing. You're not quite sure if you could climb it, not quite sure if you could get down, and that's the result of that was the big fall, because I couldn't climb on, and I couldn't climb down, running out of strength. And that's when, that's when my foot slipped off and I, I can't wheel down the wall. What John did next caused a furore. Thought about it, thought about it quite intensely, and I thought, I'm going to place a bolt. Fuck it, you know, it doesn't have to stay. Nothing's permanent. You know, the style of the day, you know, was like mentioned to a few people and said, well, you got a right to, you know, you highest on the wall, you place a bolt, you know. You know, an afterthought, it was like, of course, you know, I mean, what a bit of a daft thing to do, really. But that was my high point. I did arrogance of the day, you know, pissing against a tree, I placed a bolt. I never went back, never went back in, um, in sticky boots. Three years went by. The first sticky rubber boots arrived in Britain. They belonged to Jerry Moffat. Wearing them, he became the first person to climb the master's wall, but in doing so, he avoided the line of the wall, the line of Indian face. And in 1986, Johnny Dawes became obsessed by that line, the true line. In the skies above the Reich, bombing daily. It had all these challenges that epitomized what I liked about climbing and a lot of history and a lot of people that I, I really respected had, uh, had um, played out their efforts on the cliff. It also suited my climbing style and what I'd learnt on gritstone, climbing on, on brick edges, meant that I was, um, I was going to say, su supremely um, prepared for that challenge. 
I think during that period what Johnny did have, which the other, the other climbers of the time actually didn't have, was a real climbing maturity and confidence in himself where he actually believed that he could climb all sorts of things which had been already been failed on by some of the best climbers. You know, Moffat, Pete Willens, Red Ed, um, the best climbers of the time had tried Indian Face and had failed. And I think a lot of us felt that it wasn't really for us and didn't even look at it. Whereas Johnny really had the belief in himself. He went up there, he made it his project and he actually climbed it first. And you know, you can't take it away from him. The style in which Johnny did it, cleaning the route from an abseil rope top roping sections of it to learn the moves was controversial but it was his life that was on the line and the route was mortally dangerous. Indian face as a climb was a head point. What that actually means is that the climb is practiced to a degree that probably before that routes were only practiced by top roping a few times then led. What became the way was routes were practiced more so that the moves were actually rehearsed to the point where you could almost climb them unconsciously. And um, that actually opens a new world to climbers in that you're almost in a zen-like unconscious state when you do the climbing. And that's how the harder, bolder climbs in the 80s were climbed, mid-80s. Everyone's entitled to the style of the day, you know, and you know, it's difficult to criticise future styles. Johnny's effort was uh, was superb, but at the same time, my criticism of that was that he was using sports climbing tactics on something that was inherently for me very, very adventurous. You know you can climb it, so there is a big, massive psychological difference between the two styles. On October the 4th, 1986, Johnny made the ascent of Indian Face and his own indelible mark on climbing history. There is no film of the original climb. This footage shows Johnny repeating the upper part of Indian Face during his first ascent of West Indian Face in 1988. When I was climbing Indian Face, I was, I was like a borderline alcoholic. I was like drinking half a bottle of whiskey sometimes during the week. And I wasn't particularly happy, which, which just basically allowed me to, to go out the route with, with, with a full bore attitude. At this point, he's just joined Indian Face. There's quite a lot of gear on it, but it's all rubbish. It's like a sort of A5 aid route with, um, with 7C um, climbing. And um, that's if you get it absolutely right at 7C and that's if your boots are squeaky, so it sort of, it, it turns nasty at the drop of a hat. Although sticky rubber has made some difference to the wall, after about 50 foot or so, your boots become unsticky, and I can remember working out where I could re-squeak re my boots on the wall. He may have had prior knowledge of the route from a top rope, but he came back and he led it without. E9 6C, the highest technical standard of its time. Devoid of good protection, the prospect of surviving a fall from the crux negligible, that was the combination of factors that made this climb so momentous. Indian Face is a bit of a curious one because it's particularly long. So when you're, doing, when you're climbing a route like Indian Face, which might have 100 feet of hard climbing, you actually can't rehearse and practice all the moves, so you, won't, so you won't forget them actually on the ascent. What that means is the bubble is likely to burst and you likely have problems to solve at the time. The only time the bubble uh, burst from because of somebody else was... Uh, a friend called Clive was on Great Wall Belay, and I, I looked across at him. To, I, I sort of took the really bad move of, of, of uh, having a social interaction during the route. And I, and I just remember feeling how crazy where I was suddenly, and the, and the, the romance of it all seemed, uh, seemed distant. 
as soon as I started moving again, the the the, the sort of um, the roar of the atmosphere in your body kind of kind of comes in. Okay, watch on this. This next bit's really hard. The actual climbing is phenomenal. Each hole that you need is there. Um, and some of the handholds are quite big, but the footholds to use them are, are, are quite delicate to use, and there's always quite a lot of dynamics about the movement. fall off you you it's not going to be a good not going to be a good situation you've got one rp2 at 70 foot and uh, the rest of the runners are, are, are going to tinkle prettily while you crater out Come on, don't go straight. more than good it was great you might put forward your own candidates but the consensus is that this lead finesse them all was the greatest well it leaves me with a, with a feeling of, of, of flying high of doing something amazing holding the jug at the end of getting the flake and getting the jug and you look down and it's cloggy there's the valley there's there's Wales, Anglesey, the rest of the world. I just remember feeling really amazing hanging on that jug. But I'm not sure I want to say how I feel hanging on that jug. So I don't want to associate myself with a, a reflection on, on, on what I feel. You know, an Indian face gives you something that isn't a fucking reflection. You in cage was the blueprint for our That's age. Yeah. Then we burned and we burned with desire to know more. 
in the tub that was passed. Cloggy's just a, an amazing bottle of wine, an essence of the crag that, um, that you can, that never kind of leaves you. So talking about it is, is not so um, kind of easy to do, but I, I, I feel it in, in myself, a bit like, um, well, how do, you, how do you describe the presence of an essential feeling within yourself? It, it, it makes me feel... Um, wider, more um, involved in being alive. The history doesn't end there. An event so seismic inevitably produces aftershocks. Before Johnny made the first ascent of West Indian face, there were some disturbing discoveries. Oh, another... Oh, God, he's been an absolute bastard. That wasn't there either. And there. And there. And there. Oh, God, this is awful. Oh, bloody hell! Actually, on Indian face, about uh, four feet below the overlap, Johnny found a chipped runner where two hairline cracks, the, the, the rock had been chipped out between. And what it left was a very good RP4 placement, which meant that the, that the climbing on Indian face was then safe. All right, you're kind of 20 feet, 30 feet above that, but you won't fall to the ground. It was a bomb-proof runner. That one there. All manufactured these for sure. It's not much sign of wear and tear though, they're just cleaned out, aren't they? Oh come on, look at that, look at the side of that rock. Look at the back of it. Look, put it in here so you can see it. I mean, that's absolutely bomb proof now. Yeah. You know? And that wasn't there before, because I know this wall by the back of my hand. That one wasn't there. That one there wasn't there. That one wasn't there. I think, you know, chipping has gone on on that wall, without a doubt. It's fucking appalling, it really is. Initial suspicion fell on John Redhead. If you want to place an RP, you want it to count. So, you know, there's been a lot of radical cleaning on the rock. For everyone that top ropes on that wall, the wall is going to be damaged. Oh, I know he chipped it off now. It's like proof for me. Well, is that that top? Is that that top hole above you there? John had pulled off a crucial flake. This is the famous Indian face flake, just below the crux of the Indian face, that I was accused of prizing off um, Johnny's route, which is a pretty absurd thing. Uh, but it caused a lot of controversy, and Johnny got wound up. As you see, it's mostly brown, rotten rock, with these areas of gray rock that were holding it in. Because Johnny placed the peg here, um, it kind of creaked, and uh, the next year, the water comes down the face, it freezes. I come to clean the route the next year, find the, find the flake, see the peg, pull on the peg. The flake made this kind of creaking noise, and we knew it was loose. So it just came off, came off in my arms, and I carried it down. It was all good Welsh rock should go, it should go home back to your house where you live. It's a tradition. But it really wound Johnny up, because he thought I'd done it on purpose. But, you know, I felt bad about it, because it's, um, it left a scar on the root and on the rock. So I, I, felt, I felt obliged as an artist to put something back on the rock. So I, I attempted uh, a little painting where the scar was, which had, um, which really wound Johnny up even more, even though the intentions were really sound and kind of sacred. But that was my attempt at putting something back as an artist, not as a climber. Climbing for me has always been a laugh and it's been very passionate and, um, you know, but you've got to remember that all climbing damages the rock, you know, and everyone's to blame in, in that one, everyone. No one ever admitted to the chipping. 
Johnny responded in his own way. He then returned and filled the placement and did it in fact so well that um, several years later when I did the second descent of Indian Face and Neil did the third, we couldn't find that uh, cleaned out placement at all. He must have filled it so well and the lichen's grown back over it, so that's superb really. I don't think people rock climb anymore. Rock climbing's dead, so people probably haven't thought about it as a possible ambition. We it's just not really got any, um, hasn't really got any benefit to anybody in, in terms of uh, impressiveness now, because all the all the sort of jism's been taken out of it. But the actual rock and the climbing is is beyond compare for for me. I mean, when I still think about it, I can still feel the the moves in me. You know, if you if you climb unconsciously and, and uh, and you're not talking to yourself while you climb, the moves um, remain indelible as kind of uh, memories in you. A bit like you don't forget what a raspberry tastes like. The big prize is still there. I mean, the big prize is still there because that's what, for me, it was always an on-site thing. And I graded at E9 for an on-site ascent. <laughs>